it does carry that storyline as well because yeah. a lot of people then when they come in they they mesmerized by all the detail and the color and then of course because they're my props and they're things I can play with and that's the other thing as well is the playfulness of stuff we forget life so serious at the moment Oh yeah. And unfortunately, hi, how are you doing? I'm fine. How beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is my workshop. Oh. And yeah, you can see Shane in the background. It's a portrait of him that was drawn by a local artist, Jonathan Julies. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> That's, uh, I'm so sorry to, to know, um, of the sad news. Yeah, I mean, it's been six months on the 5th, was six months ago. But it's, yeah, I don't know, you know, what can you do? You know, it's, yeah. we share, she, we often talked about what would happen when we got older. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it was maybe a macabre thing to do, but we had been together for such a long time. And of course, we had looked after friends who had passed away from cancer or from HIV and stuff like that. And, Shane living as a as a man with HIV he you know and as a social worker he knew of the progression and the problems and all sorts of stuff and I suppose he never wanted that for himself and the fact that he died of a heart attack so quickly actually was something that he would have wanted actually and mm. yeah I mean as young as he was I mean we also had such a very, very hectic time in the, in, in the last few days. I mean, we were so together and so focused on each other and so focused on doing things that actually we had no time to sort of be sad or mm. anything at all. I mean, and on the day he died, actually, yeah, I, we were actually, yeah, I had to try and calm him down because he had been blogging and we had been hosting a Barry Dale and Bloom and he had been up at the Quarries, which is like an informal settlement. And he had been, part of the Bloom was to create for the, the, the whole thing about food gardens. So he wanted to actually have a lot more sort of like, he, people who ordinarily aren't seen, they're sort of glossed over. They're not, they're, they're not, they're not held up because they don't have a big, huge home with manicured lawns and clipped rose bushes and that type of thing. These people are living in small little dwellings with a very sort of almost a, a door sized garden that they would actually grow food in. And he was handing out seeds and really sort of what they call upstuart or sort of, no, that's the wrong word. What is the Afrikaans word to sort of like uplift? Is it upstuart? I mean, you keep saying whoops, but I don't know. It's not. Oops, yeah, yeah. My, my, our, our friend Tillman's in the background, Jay. Yeah, he's been helping me with stuff ever oh, okay. since Shane passed away. And yeah, he's a very close friend of ours. So mm -hmm. he might pop in to say hi. Yes, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> that would be wonderful. But what a what a lovely what a lovely uh, memory he left, you know? that you can talk about this and and uh, the wonderful things that uh, he, he was all about people he mm -hmm. you know as a quaker he identified with the garden in people he identified mm -hmm. with all of that sort of stuff so it was about yeah he, uh, even even though we're in an art studio and we and he's not himself not an artist he was an artist with people he would yeah. listen and we would talk about things, you know, fundamental things that really matter. That I suppose, you know, I mean, there we go. We make chandeliers and stuff like that. But, it, but we also make stuff out of recycled mediums. So even the most humblest medium can become something of great importance or have great value, actually. And often when I talk to people on the street, because I, I pick up r litter and I don't want to call it rubbish. I, I suppose it's the detritus of us, of humankind, that we just leave. We purchase things and we don't really think about what we're doing with them. And I suppose I like to point out to people that all of these elements, even though you buy 
a bottle of cool drink or something, you own the bottle and you own the lid and you own all of that sort of stuff. And a lot of people don't see that at all. So often with things, I you take and you know you take one or two and they don't look like anything. You then make a whole pile and it starts becoming something quite awesome almost. I mean, you sort of see the color. You the the the, the rubbish part of it fades and the value of the color or the form actually starts becoming the most important element in it. So for me, that, that language is really, really, really important. I, I totally agree with you. And, and you know, I think I, I grew up in the 60s and I think we were much more, uh, I think, um, uh, creating in, in that sense, taking something and making something out of it. Um, because we lived in a time where it wasn't, uh, you know, we, we didn't have as much as, as people have today. And I, I love what you do. Absolutely. You know, I think this is, this is so wonderful to think it, it's like you say, it's not rubbish. It's definitely not rubbish because the purpose of say, um, I would say a bottle cap, um, when it was designed, it wasn't designed to be rubbish. It was designed to, for, a, for a specific reason. And we give it the, the we make it unnecessary. Uh, we call it rubbish when we throw well, it we away. We talk but, about the throwaway, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's not rubbish because there was somebody who designed that cap who made it for a specific reason. But now... Um, where did the where did the idea come from to make say the chandeliers for example or i want to ask, i want to go more uh, where did this fascination with what whatever is lying around you can make something with well it was a it was a journey we moved to barrydale which is a small rural village in in the western cape in the glencora I mean, we have a population of about 4,000 people in the district, in the area. Most of the people are farm workers. There are, and then there are some sort of professional people as well. And there are a lot more professional people moving into the area since, since COVID and since the intervention of internet and all of that type of thing. So you're seeing a bit of more of a, a boost with people coming in and with different ideas and different things. But we, we started working with, with found and collected items. Oh, when we first moved here, actually, a, a previous colleague of mine, a collaborator, he and I were busy working on, on something. And on the opposite corner of where we are, there's a liquor store and there's a very cheap wine that is sold there that a lot of the farm workers actually come and buy on a Friday and a Saturday. And we often find the, ro the roid droppies or the red caps lying around. So we were picking them up and we had this pile of stuff and Sean said to me, oh, you know, we should do something with this stuff. And we had been talking about it as well because there had been another client from Holland who had come to see us and they liked what we did and they wanted us to do something for them over a Christmas period. They were here visiting. They have a home here too, not in, in Cape Town, but, uh, and they wanted to see, they just wanted something that was spontaneous for this beautiful architecturally designed home in, in Oranya in Cape Town. And so we were busy joking around, Sean and I, and we'd gone up to the up to the dump as well and we were looking at it and I sort of sniffed the air and I said to Sean I said can you smell that and he said what's that I said that's the smell of money all of this medium here actually costs something it's it's been thrown away and discarded but it actually did cost something there was a lot of design that had gone into it and engineering engineering of a of a Coke bottle, that sort of shape and everything. When we make our flowers, we use that architecture to make up the flowers. So often when we work with kids or with other adults who ordinarily wouldn't look at that stuff, we say, okay, this Coke bottle costs so much to produce and they made a mold of it. And 
there's this medium that we mine and we then convert it into plastics and then it's injection molded and all of this process happens and then people consume the product and then they throw it away. And that, there's more to that. There is, there's definitely more to that. So we went up to the dump and we were collecting things. And I suppose when we first started making up chandeliers, we ordinarily would go to a store to buy beads from a wholesaler or whatever. But we would never find beads big enough. And if you did find beads big enough, they would be too too small or too not enough or too expensive or, or you wouldn't find the color. And we then with this client from, from, from Holland, we said, let's put our, our, teeth, our tongues in our cheek and actually make up something out of trash. So we made up a beautiful double tiered chandelier, very much like what's hanging in the background. Yeah. And instead of replacing, we replaced all the crystal with plastic. And it was a very formal piece, but you had this like injection of plastic and layers of stuff. And the client walked in and he's a Dutch man and he looked at me and he said, wow, that really makes me happy. It makes me think of a snoopier. A snoopier is a, like a licorice all sorts. It's obviously what oh. people mm -hmm. in Holland call a licorice all sort, or it's a type mm -hmm. of product that they anyway it's a licorice stacked sweet and it had all those vibrant colors lots of black and white as well so you had the graphicness of it and he said we emptied out our whole house and made we painted it all white we had these two or three pieces hanging in this vacant space and they just immediately fell in love with them and they were put into various homes and stuff but yeah i mean they therein was the magic of that transformation, to see the stuff on the street, to take it in, and even not to wash it, but to actually start using it as it was. And that ended up being this double-tiered piece that we thought, okay, well, this has actually now got merit. There's, there's yeah. somebody in high design who's seen this, really got happy and excited about it. And we thought, okay, well, this is something that we can really push and persevere. And yeah, that's that's sort of the nuts and bolts of where it started. So that's when we moved here 18 years ago is when we started using that medium. So, yeah, and it's, of course, it's an endless, an endless supply of it. You can never, ever, ever sort of exhaust that at all. And there's so yeah. many different ideas when you start playing with it and stacking it or melting it or bonding them together. We've we've sort of worked out a way of joining the lids where we could actually create words or a symbol. And it was a, yeah, it was another way of our lid art of actually creating something a little bit more graphic and very street and quite gritty, but you could actually give it another meaning. And we've, we've made big pieces actually. Mm. There's, there's yeah, I, I haven't yeah. got any up, but uh, they are on the website, which I'm still working on. <laughs> but I was just thinking uh, when I first saw it, I thought to, to myself that it's you're really making a new story of you, you're creating a new story, a new a new product from from a lot of other products. So, so you're really making a new story. And I think this is so wonderful, you know, that you you actually make you made me look at at uh things in a different way so you know this this bottle cap now has a totally different function and I think this it's a, a, a very much a mental uh and, and 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 it has a deeper it has a deeper message as well I, I thought about it a lot when I after I first saw it and you know all the meanings that you actually bring to it so I think something like that in a in a room can really be a conversational piece. It's not just oh, yeah, no, object, it, it, it yeah. does it does carry that storyline as well because yeah. a lot of people then when they come in, they they're mesmerized by all the detail and the color. And then of course, because they're my props and they're things I can play with. And that's the other thing as well is the playfulness of stuff. We forget Life's so serious at the moment, yeah. and it really is. I mean, we have terrible sort of war and conflict. People are suppressed. People are sort of done under and all sorts of stuff. And 
sometimes we don't give ourselves that break or that fun to just really enjoy some space or this place. And we're not precious about the things as well. I mean, people come in here and we used to freak out about kids running around the space, but in actual fact, in the time that we've had the shop, nothing's ever fallen over or gotten broken. In fact, it's the adults that break things. It's not the children. <laughs> <laughs> but so. isn't it wonderful that children now see that and that they can, they can, you know, I think always it's this stimulation when you have as a young child. Um, I mean, I remember doing woodwork in my grandfather's uh, shed. Um, and it, I'm not a woodworker, but that actually made me now th look at things differently. I look at how things are constructed you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by how things are constructed. And it was just that exposure to, to woodworking and, and making and creating. And now you're giving this opportunity to children to see, because the next time they're going to see a, a bottle cap or an empty bottle, they're going to immediately think creatively. Yes, no, absolutely. And I, the, the added value, I mean, of making a flower that you've, I mean, again, a disused piece of work. But again, I suppose when you start imbuing that, that piece with intention and with love, yeah. it starts developing its own, its own value. And you can, you can take a, a, an old um, soda bottle and you can take a Sharpie marker and you can write poetry on it or, a love, a love note to somebody and you can really sort of work the surface without even before cutting it and then maybe take some old stale nail polish and make spots in it and do all sorts of things and then you cut the bottle up, disregard all of the pattern and all the stuff that you, so you really abstract it again, you sort of like, and then you open it up and you start seeing other things that happen and it's always that surprise, you never quite know how things are going to turn out. And if it doesn't turn out as, as what you think it is, it will actually evolve into something else or you'll think of something else. And again, it's when we've, when we've done workshops with people, we've often had a whole pile of soda bottles in the middle of the garden, middle of the, of the, or in either the garden or the space that we're working in. And people are so nervous to sort of like, Oh, yeah. mark it or cut it. I mean, I always say to them, but you mustn't be nervous. I mean, it's been lying around. Part of the recycling process is to reduce or to make it smaller. So as soon as you start doing that and you start separating, so you've got the bottle caps and you take the label off and you put that in another pile and then you take all of what I call the nail clippings. So you cut around the bottle to make petals and then you give it stamens and stuff and all those little off cuts you keep in a pile i mean that's that pile on its own if you get enough of you can remelt it and you can make up more bottles and that's what the recycling is about you become part of the recycling process you actually start separating and sorting as you go along and then you start seeing that we waste so much and we could actually yeah. just collect all of that sort of stuff You've done half the recycling process already, the cleaning, the reducing, and the sorting. And if you had a person who came and collected that medium, you can immediately pelletize that without having any contamination whatsoever and actually make up fresh things. And that's, 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 that process is as important as creating a finished or, or an object itself in this, in this time where we are living. So, yeah, I mean... There's value in all so of that type of stuff. I get so excited when you speak. <laughs> this is absolutely, it's so true, all these things. This is so, and, and we are, and like you say, we are so scared to, to cut things or, or see just something else that can, can be made of it. Like you say, now you cut the, you make flower petals from the bottles, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, just go and get a flower. Just... Yeah, yeah, please. So, this here is an idea. I mean, 
You can wow. see the wood grain that's drawn on wood grain. And then we make up a paint where I will take a real, real sort of cheap child's poster paint and you mix that with a bit of an acrylic glue, like a wood glue or a, what they call a podge, modge glue. And that then that adheres to the plastic like you can't believe. I mean, you cannot scrape the plastic mm. paint off. So you actually get a really permanent wow. thing. And, and then one, one flower can make, you've got a top, which is the part, this top part, and then you have a bottom part. So you've actually got one flower that could actually evolve and you can wow. give it to somebody. And there's, you've, you've sort of created something yourself with the intention for somebody else. And it, I don't know, for me, that, that love or that intention really carries a message of care and responsibility maybe, or, or just, yeah, maybe a little bit more thought that goes into something. When we've also, when we've done workshops, we, in 2012, we were invited by the Queen's University in Belfast for their 50th arts anniversary. And we occupied the, the Norton Gallery, which is in the university itself, which is attached to the university. And they, we, on the way to the, the gallery in the morning, from our hotel, we were all dressed up in our nice clean clothing, all ready to be to, to, to speak to people. But we would go into hedges and into the gutters and carry a bag and collect all the bottles that we would go up. People would be shocked at us because they would see people who were smartly dressed picking up bottles. And I do it daily. I, I, I stuff things into my pockets. It doesn't matter where I am. It's a habit that I'm getting into that that grosses people out a lot of the time, but it actually, it, it, again, it's a starting point. People want to know what you're doing, and then you start talking about it. It's your introduction. It's, it's your tool to actually start speaking to another audience. And that audience can be a child of five years old who, and if you spend the time just talking, you sort of install something, and then they see something, and then they're inspired. And, that's what I remember as a child, going to see something and then going home and wanting to emulate or to copy it or to make up something like that. And you're always disappointed because you never have quite the same feel or the look. But of course, that comes with practice. And the more you practice and the more you play with something, the more the language or development you actually get with that. So that's what I like to encourage. It's never... Nothing's ever finished or done. I believe you can still carry on with stuff. And, yeah. But you know, you say something very interesting now because um, I spoke to a um, composer once and he said that he visited a school for about three days. He did workshops with very, very young children who had no experience in music or training in music. And he did little uh, composing workshops with them. And he said he was amazed with what they came up with um, and, and, you know, the little tunes that they composed. And now I'm thinking, oh. yeah, I'm thinking now that you say, you know, you're talking to children. Do you, do you think that children would be more free or more experimental than adults? Because we already have this, all these barriers and all these um, blockages that we, we think, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, where children can easily um see you know something and, and imagine something else i think i think that comes with the dialogue and how you speak to somebody i think if you speak from a, a, you know like on a podium and you're speaking down to people but i think if you're on the same level standing on the same ground maybe even looking at eye level and you're talking about something like this that's that's quite sort of, I don't know, maybe for some people they look at it and they don't see the value or the merit in that. But on, on the days after when Shane passed away, I was walking the dogs, I go for a walk every morning. My mum's got some goldens and we go down to the river and they swim and then I do my round. And as I was coming down the one road, a whole lot of kids ran past me, all carrying flowers. Mm. And I thought, Wow, in all of this stuff that's happening in my life, there's some kids out there who are 
creating things. And they came in this whole gallery in the front, on the front veranda of our shop, which, which sort of fronts onto the main road, was just full of flowers and recycled flowers stuck in all the pots and that type of thing. And it's, for me, I mean, I've still got them. In fact, I've used those flowers as well in certain installations and, you know, reworked them and sort of put more color onto them, but loved them a bit more. Yeah. Not because of they were ugly or anything at all, because it's they're not. They're not ugly. They're, yeah. The intention is beauty, and the intention is an actual remembering and a loving. And yeah, I mean, yeah, it was just it. As sad as I was, it put a smile on my face because I knew that we had broken through, even in that little level of understanding of of people looking at stuff and wanting to to sort of stand together you know yeah. as, and just even if it's to grieve together to celebrate together and that's what we do every year on the 16th of december we we build a trash tree at that's so it's the, it's it's the day of reconciliation so we normally have a light christmas tree lighting and there's a parade that happens and there's lots of excitement and net for Pretz is an after schools program in the village started up by a man named Peter Tequilo and Shane was on the board of net for Pretz as a chairperson just to be somebody as a sounding board and as a social worker I'm always very mindful of the fact that you're working with very vulnerable people you're working with people ordinarily you don't have very much so you you're working with very poor people and the idea is not to push that into the faces, but to rather look at the enjoyment and the fun that one can actually get and the, the, the social and the, the, the enjoyment of sharing things together. So that's the 16th of December is always such a joyous time for us. We always have this big lighting ceremony. There's a piece of ground at the bottom of the garden where Shane and I got married and we gorilla gardened it. We planted trees. And it, it belonged to the council and we, we started putting out Christmas tree installations there and the council then said to us, you know, you actually need to get permission to do this. And we, we, we got permission for the parades and stuff, but we, we sort of like, we, we knew we were overstepping the boundary. We thought we're not going to wait for people to sign pieces of paper and give us this. Yeah. If we look after it and we clean up it, they, people will see it. And they did. They suddenly saw that this environment the fence had washed away in the one flood. So I coiled that up and I put it away and people asked me, but aren't you going to put the fence up? I said, but why? It's a public piece of ground. I hate barriers. I don't like fences, things with barbs and barbed wire. I said, who, I'm who am I trying to keep out? This is yeah. a public space. It's for all of us to enjoy. And so now we have a, we, I, we're, I'm a custodian now of that piece of ground just below us. And every year we, put in a tree and this year we built a whale. Um, when I, when we were busy moving from the one studio to the other, I found all these drawings I did a few years ago of this whale and I said to Shane the one morning while he was still in bed, I said, I think we need to change the format because Magpie at that stage was changing its format as well. And there's great, uh, you know, all of our trash, our chemical trash, our plastic trash, sometimes that gets into the water and ends up going down into the sea. And we really need to look after that. Maybe we need to start talking about that now at the source. So I built this big whale. There she's seven meters long. Her name's Galaxy because she's filled with LEDs and color changing lights. But she's made up of a drift net that we, I got from the beach. I took it off the beach. It was still pristine and mint condition and it had obviously been washed overboard a boat but it was all tangled up with weeds and stuff like that and I took that all out and we used it as a Christmas tree the last year and I saw the way the light penetrated or was carried by the the, the actual fishnet itself and I liked the way it actually held the shape so I created a very loose uh, sketch that I then drew onto the back wall of this of the studio here. And then I did some reading and I read that a southern right whale was 14 meters long. And I thought, 
I'm not going to have enough medium and it's only me to sort of build this thing. So I thought, okay, I'll do it half scale. And it's still seven meters. It's still a big wow. piece, three dimensional object. And yeah, she's still up by going to illuminate her every evening. And it's actually quite nice to see the interaction of people around there and just going to chill out or having a lunch there in the afternoon and the dogs go down there because there's a compost heap there as well. And it's just, yeah, lots of stuff always. And it's quite lovely, actually. It's, it's a shared space and mm-hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's a celebrated space as well. People know it now. But you so know, you, you could take some, mm-hmm. yeah. No, you, you uh, it, it's such a great testament uh, how the community uh, uh, reacted with the flowers and, and, you know, what you are doing. And I think sometimes it's, it, I think while you were talking now, I was just thinking you actually uh, in your community do exactly what you're doing with your chandeliers. You know, you pick up these bits that, that society have, thrown out Discarded. and it's yeah. also the people you know you you you're giving the people value again and 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 uh something that has meaning and how wonderful it's i i really think the work you're doing is just so much broader than just your sh- your chandeliers and all your recycling i think the work you're doing in the community i mean this is really something to be applauded Thank you. Well, that's, I suppose that's Shane's legacy. I mean, to understand human rights is to understand everybody. And we have a lot of problems with, with alcoholism in the, in, the, in, the, in the district. It's a hangover from a very long time ago, um, from the Dorpstassel and that sort of way of, of, of working with peoples. And then often the peoples just get they, they are, they're considered throwaway. They're not, mm-hmm. their value, their lives don't have value. And we, we, can't, we can't do that anymore. We have to actually sort of look at the way we operate and how we do things. And we really actually, that has to change. If we are going to change anything, we've got to change from all of those levels all the way up. We talk about lack of education and stuff. There is education. There's education. But there's also, there's, there's needs to be a little bit more inspiration. There needs to be a lot more people who actually come in and inspire people to do things. And it's not about wagging a finger or screaming and shouting or suppressing people. It's about an understanding and actually listening, listening to the people or to the client that comes in and they, they talk to you about stuff. I mean, it could be, we've, we've made up people p- pieces where we've taken the idea of a chandelier and we've turned it into a heritage piece. So somebody will come in, a client, which we've done, a client comes in and she's got a whole box of her late sister's jewelry. Her late sister died a few years ago, back, quite a few years back, and they would have been very close, these two siblings. And then it's time for something to be done with this because Shane had been talking about a memory piece or a, or a heritage piece. And we've taken old tea sets and we've created a chandelier out of them or individual items and made them into something. But, cele- but being very careful how we work with the, with the actual porcelain or the pieces as well, because you don't want to destroy it. You actually want yes. to retain that memory. And before, when we did teapot pieces, we would actually break up the teapots and then re-glue them back together. But then we got a bit more sophisticated and then we now drill holes and we join things together. So the finishes are a lot more complete. And it's not, if you've got a celebrated teacup from your great-great-grandmother, you don't want to smash it or break it, even if it is a controlled break. You want to sell it. You want to try and keep everything together. So... You sort of listen to those voices inside you saying, you can't do that. It's like, you know, you can't put your name onto somebody pieces, somebody else's artwork. You've got to keep that as the memory. Anyway, this a client came in, as I was saying to you, with all this jewelry. And 
she, this young woman had died in her 20s. I don't know of, from what or how, but it had been quite a tragic thing for the sister to, to deal with. And then she decided that she wanted a chandelier made from all the pieces in, encrusted in the rim. And it was the weirdest thing because no matter what I did, I couldn't work the composition. I had to allow, let go. I had to just let go of my ideas. And it was a weird thing because at some stage I actually felt I was being used by somebody to do something. Not that I claimed to be a medium or anything, but I suppose in my thought process and dealing with these memories, I felt I can't impose my will on this too much. I need to, I need to actually understand the memories. And I would smell the old perfume in like because you're wearing a piece of jewelry, they start smelling of the people. So I would smell this incredible smell of the person, the late, the late sister. And it was the, it was unbelievable because I had sort of finished the piece and then I called the client. I said, your piece is done. And I hung it up and we illuminated it and everything. And you show the piece to the client. And she immediately burst into tears because that was so close to her. And she said, you've done such a beautiful job and you've respected her stuff that she had made. I hadn't destroyed the things that she had put together and she had been studying jewelry design. So some things were a little bit off and a little bit odd, but I've sort of managed to get it all together. And it, she's, yeah, she said, this is such an emotional time, thing Amazing. for me because now I'll be able to look at my sister and I've seen her jewelry and I saw where she wore it and she was a little bit offbeat, a bit of a punk. So, and I love that, the fact that you've used that punky jewelry in this piece because now it's her and it's, yeah. And I will be able to give this to, to my daughter or my son and that her legacy will live on. It's not just for me, it's for a whole lot of it's other amazing. people. It's amazing. It's amazing. So those, yeah, those I, memory yeah. pieces are as important. Those mm -hmm. things that you touch, those, and you've got to understand and respect that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, definitely. I think this is, and, and again, you know, this is creating a new story, something mm -hmm. of, that might have been sad for them to look at if they it was just lying in a box but now you've created an artwork and it brings joy you know yeah you illuminate it and it's yeah it's celebratory it's not it's not a sorrowful thing it's it really is it's joyful to look at when you have light in something your eyes drawn to it i mean you yeah. i mean there's a there's a, a very subtle light on shane's face there but you are drawn to that because you don't know why, but it's like a moth to a flame. Yeah. So you immediately put a light onto something and it immediately is lifted up as well. So there's yeah. all of that stuff that happens. It's so wonderful. And and but now this this chandelier that's there in the background, what is that made of? The that piece there. Yeah. It's actually made with plastic bottle tops and it's made with tin back so all the drops we've actually made out of tin cans i made a pattern i'm a i'm a fashion designer by that's my training i did really? a fine art and then, yeah. and then i studied three years of fashion and worked in the industry until the mid 90s and i my last job was working as a as a surfwear designer for o'neill in california and I, I suppose meeting the O'Neills on a, on, a, on a trip, we had gone to show what we were going to be doing in South Africa with regard to, because we have such a large shoreline and surf, the surf industry is also such a booming industry, especially amongst the youth. And also in Cape Town, you have people in Kailicha and Guguletu who ordinarily wouldn't go surfing. They go to workshops in Musenberg and they learn to surf and they're learning a di whole different dialogue. And they normally stay, would see that as the sort of like, oh, why would you want to go surfing? You know, the whiteies do that. But I actually know. surfboarding, skating, skateboarding, all that street culture is endemic to all youth, regardless yeah. of where you're brought up. And your music today also inspires all of that type of thing. So... Bridget O'Neill, who's um, Jack O'Neill's daughter, 
they're very into sort of the social aspect. So they would take kids out from East LA, kids that were really on the fringe, and they would go on a camp. And they would go in this beautiful catamaran worth millions. I mean, people would hire this boat, these film stars and pop stars, and they would then go off on a trip. But they would often take kids out as well on these little journeys and talking talk about what the Pacific was meant to the American coastline and the fact that we need to look after that coast. And I suppose Bridget then sort of, she, 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 she identified something within me and because that's what they get, they get involved with social aspect. And when we started Magpie, I remember Shane, <laughs> Shane was a very traumatic day. Um, Shane was busy beading some stuff at home. And I came back from my then work job, which was working as this clothing designer. And he showed me what he had done. And I said, oh no, you need to do this and that and everything. And he looked at me and he took the whole tray of beads and he threw them across the room. And he said, I'm a social worker. I'm not a designer, I'm not an artist. I said, but you are, but you've got to, you know, for me, it's yeah. easy to do, to put things into some sort of formation or whatever. But for you, maybe not, but you able to talk to people, maybe that needs to be our approach. We work, for, we work together as a team, and, but you have come in with your social stuff. So and from the very onset, we've gotten involved with working with people living with HIV, working with the poor, working with kids who ordinarily wouldn't have any sort of like extramural activities. So bottle, uh, flower cutting workshops and making up bits and pieces and yeah, using hands, our hands that will actually be able to, to do something. So you might have a job, but you might be able to do something else that could also bring in an alternative mm -hmm. income. So that, that income generation has also been part of our dialogue. It's not just me, it's a whole lot of people that also get involved. And Magpie shrinks and expands and shrinks and expands. So it could change again in the next few years. Maybe I move from here and we'll go somewhere else. Maybe pack everything into a suitcase and go sailing around the world and do that type of stuff. But, but I still will be creating and working with people. Yeah. But but we'll see. I mean, we never know. <laughs> yeah. But did you grow up in South Africa? I grew up in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Um, and my father, who lives in New Zealand, was in the military, but he was a frustrated sculptor. And okay. he identified something within me that I could draw. I could pick up a pencil from a very young age and emulate and copy things and draw. So I think he he nurtured that within me to sort of like, it wasn't a weird thing to do. It, he celebrated it. He sort of like would buy me paints or pencils and stuff. But my mum being a, a nursing person and involved in, 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 in care and, and, and working in an orthopedic theatre or the orthopedics of, as a scrub sister, she... We had lots of dogs and animals, and she saw within me my love for animals as well. So she said to me, "Why well, you should become a vet. And I thought, oh, that would be a nice thing to do. But at school, when, I was, when we left Zim and we came to school in the Eastern Cape, I had gotten a detention, and I was busy cleaning a copier machine, which was a Ronia machine that you put ink into it, and you sort of can pump out all these, these test papers and stuff. And the counselor, the student counselor was sitting there Friday afternoon and he, he, we started talking. I was in the trick and he said, why are you here? And I said, I have no idea why I'm here <laughs> doing this, but I've got the tension. I'd been hauled over the coals because I'd been rude or something to an inspector. And the headmaster had called me up in front of the whole school. And uh, anyway, but it was a, it was a fortuitous thing because but Mr. Gilbert said to me, he said, have you ever done an aptitude test? He asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, no, I want to go into veterinary and that type of stuff. And he, he looked at me and he said, have you ever done an aptitude test? And I said, no, never. What is that? He said, well, it's, it's, it's basically to learn what you 
are good at. Basically, mm. your 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 direction, maybe. You need to get a little bit more clarity on where you want to go and how you want to do it. And so after, he gave me all these, these this aptitude test to fill out, went back to the hostel and filled it all out. As, and I thought, okay, I'll try and push it towards the medical side and everything. And then he looked through it and he said, and again, he said, can you draw? And I said, actually very well. And he said, what about design? Are you interested in architecture, in gardening, garden design, clothing design? That's it, actually all of those. I love architecture. I love design. I love fine art. He said, then why aren't you doing that? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe... You know, you get told that maybe a, a better career to go for is something that's a bit more structured or maybe it's a profession or that type of stuff. And he, and I told my dad this and he said, well, how about instead of going on a gap year or doing something, go to art school for a year, just a foundation course. And he had done some research and he looked at the Natal Technicon at that stage, and they had a re- they still have a very good fine arts um, foundation here, and had very good lecturers. Clive Vandenberg, who's an incredible painter, Andres Buerta, who's a brilliant sculptor, Virginia McKenney, who's another brilliant painter, a lady named Fiona Kirkwood, who I'm friends with all these people as well, and still after all these years and. They really, that foundation year was like a breath of fresh air. I worked bloody hard at it, but it was like a breath of fresh air because I now was doing things that ordinarily I was was playing to me. I didn't think it was real or would actually bring anything back to me. And yeah, I, th- that's why I went into the clothing. I did the year of fine art, then I thought, okay, clothing design has a little bit more of a practical sort of act thing to it. Let me go into that, and I love design, and I really did well in that in, in clo- during my three years of clothing design. Came the top of the class, and then of mm-hmm. course two years of conscription into the navy was the next sort of hurdle. But again, I used that to my advantage because I, I went into the tailoring department, oh, and okay. I had a I had a brilliant, brilliant. Um, officer, petty officer who was in charge of me and we worked in the stores department and we altered myriads of uniforms and sewed on braid and did all sorts of stuff for the Navy. And yeah, that's his, his knowledge was knowledge that had been handed down from father to son. And his father had learned from his grandfather and the great grandfather. And his stories about tailoring and working and like this two years of concentration in that area was really, really a godsend. It was amazing because it, it got me enthused. I was working with couturiers and making patterns and doing all sorts of stuff. So that really honed my, even though I was doing two years of conscription, I made sure I wanted to not vegetate. I wanted to yeah. move forward. And it actually really, really helped. But, but isn't yeah, it amazing? Was, yeah, isn't it amazing sometimes how one one route, one one thing it leads you to, and and I'm sure all that experience now also somehow you must have uh, you must tap into that also with your design. Oh, of course, of course. Oh. You know, you're working in volume. I mean, if yeah. even if it's a garment or a house, you're working in three dimension. Yeah. And if you can work in three dimension on those, it's it's you can just transfer those skills. There was a builder building my mum's house um, here on the on the on the in the garden when she first moved here, and it's a steel it's a lightweight steel frame construction made of new tech, and the frames all arrived, and I sort of identified all the frames lying in the garden, and then I, the builder said to me, he said, oh. Um, you look like you've got some extra walls. And I said, no, darling, those aren't extra walls. That's actually the lean-to roof on the back garage and the front. He just looked at me and he said, <laughs> how did you know that? I said, I work in three dimension. I work with patterns. And there's, yeah. there's a list of all the frames and there's the, the house plan. And I've identified all the codes and everything. And in fact, you're missing a window here on this one frame. And he looked at me and he said, 
And I said, I'm a clothing designer. I work yeah. in volume. And I said, yeah. like a builder, you're constructing something. It's mm. the same thing. He just, Amazing. he didn't, he couldn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't want to believe me. So I said, well, that's what I'm doing. Just that's transfer. amazing. <laughs> but um, Scott, you've done so much already, but tell me, what is your wish for the future? A wish for the future? Oh, to carry on doing this until, and I don't plan to stop doing this type of thing. I mean, I want to pop up somewhere and do some outrageous stuff. We, we have a piece stuff that we build and this, I'm putting it out there because actually maybe this might inspire something. In Germany, if every five years, there's an exhibition called Documenta. You might, have know, you might know of it. And people are invited. Kentridge was invited. We, we were taken by a good friend of ours, Shane and myself, as a wedding gift to go and visit Documenta in 2012. And it, I was blown away by the work because not only is it the work, but it's also the stories behind it, all about humanity and society and looking at stuff, re-looking at stuff and really unpicking stuff and looking at where we come from. And you meet people in those environments, you're from Africa, but people are just, just like you as well. They're also wanting to get involved. Anyway, a client, another German client of ours who's bought a lot of work from us, we were talking now recently with, they have a home in, in Hermanus and they were going back to Berlin. And I said, you know, it's documented this year. She said, yes, I know it's documented. I said, I really want to do something on the, I don't, I don't have to be invited, but let's, let's talk about doing something on the fringe. Mm -hmm. She said, well, so what do you want to do? I said, I want to do the peace stuff. There's a, there's a suspension bridge over the Falder River near, near the Orangery. And there's a huge big Klaus Aldenberg pick that's actually stuck into the ground next to it. And I said, you know what I'd love to do? I'd want to do an explosion or a, a, of peace doves, actually create this incredible cloud of peace doves that you walk through on the suspension bridge. But it, I said, it's, it's got to be done overnight where the installation isn't there in the evening but overnight it suddenly happens and in the morning there's this boom of peace i said that's 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 what i would like to do <laughs> so wow. yeah so it's a lot of talking and lots of that type of thing but you know i believe that if there are lots of hands who are willing people to do things i think that we could actually do something like that so babette says to me so how many peace stuffs oh i don't know she says, a hundred thousand. I looked at her, I said, that's a lot of hands. That's yeah. a lot of hands. I mean, and you could, you could get a hundred thousand people to make up one piece of each and you could actually do it. It's mm -hmm. very possible and you could do it in a very short period of time. But wow. yeah, that, I, that's, I... that's a fantasy and it could happen. I mean, I've met people recently when talking about this and they said, oh, I know somebody in Kassel and they, they definitely would get into that. Mm. I said, even as a fringe um, gorilla piece, I, they said even better because that's the stuff that creates the noise. That's the stuff yeah. that you want to create that you want to shake up the foundations and show mm. people how and what. And it does. It gives you a platform to, to talk from. Exactly. So, yeah. But I, I'm, I'm in the uh, wishes come true business. I, I believe wishes come true. So, <laughs> and you've said it here. And there have been wishes that came true after it's been uh, expressed here on my channel. So. Oh, good. Yeah. So <laughs> I would love to know when. <laughs> I would love to know when it happens. <laughs> Oh no! I definitely, I, I'll definitely. If you, if I do, if we do, ha if it does happen, I'll I'll call you immediately. Definitely, definitely yeah, yeah, <laughs> that would be great. But um, and and your colleague, I would love to see your colleague. Is, is your colleague there? He's, he, he's downstairs. He's been oh, hanging up some stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. But now, Scott, um, just one last thing. Is there a shout out you would like to do for a shop or restaurant in your area? 
You must have lo lovely little restaurants there in the. Oh, uh, we've got quite a few. There's the new, there's the Karoo Art Hotel, which is diagonally opposite us. That's just been um, renovated, mm -hmm. and it's there's they they again they they've also done some unbelievable things in the space. It's it's an it's an I mean historically it's actually had people standing on the steps and rabble rousing Urubur in the area to go after the English. And so oh. it's for, for Shane, he loved that idea that that there was this man who stood on the steps of the Barrydale Hotel and got everybody together to sort of like stand together. Yeah, and anyway, Sue and Rick Melville have bought the hotel and they've been renovating it and it's a, it's open, but there's still bits and pieces that are happening. But what really points to, what really showed me about their passion was immediately as they started working in the hotel, they created a bakery. And there's a young lady in the bakery who makes beautiful sourdough bread and croissants and bagels and stuff. She's a lady that we've known for a long time, Shane and I. And she's now has, she's not quite famous. She's actually oh. in this little bakery. I mean, in amongst all the, the, the cacophony of all the, the sores and people shouting and bricks and things collapsing and stuff. She's been making bread. It was, you know, all, all a, a complete shout out to Rick and Sue because I said to them, I said, you're amazing because yeah. you've even started making the building as a work site into something that actually can generate an income, not yeah. only for this young woman, but also for yourselves. And you will be, it's, I've always believed that where there's food cooking like that and you smell it like bread, it draws people. And I said, you're drawing people to your, and they allow people to go through the web, the work site. I know on a work site, you often don't want Joe Public walking through, but yeah. people are fascinated. They like to watch. They like to see yeah, things exactly. happening. And they like to meet people. Yeah. So don't make it a mystery. Let's, let, let's, let's make it into something quite gorgeous and quite fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I totally agree. I mean, I, I'm also fascinated by building works and I would have loved to see that. But Barrydale, I mean, this is such a, a sweet little town. And um, who is the who is the lady that bakes the bread? Oh, I don't know her name. Oh, oh I think okay. It's funny, but but <laughs> yeah, I know I know her from sight and I, I've been going to Barrydale, but I will definitely. I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I, no, no, no. No, 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 that's fine. No, I just wondered, I thought you maybe, you know, knew her. But um, Scott, thank you so much for your time, for these uh, this lovely conversation. I am so excited about what you do. And I would so love to come and visit you when I come to South Africa again. Please. You yeah. must, you must. I want to come and do um, a workshop well, there. <laughs> December is, the December 16th. Yeah. It's such a special time in the village. Okay. We really do have a lot. We get lots of tourists at that time, but because it's school holidays and because Net for Pret have been putting up a little play, well, not a little play, it's actually grown into quite a big event. I mean, they not only do they create the storyline, there's a musical score, there's costume. There's the performance aspect of it, and every child that comes that is involved with Net for Bread, from five year olds right up until the, the late teens, because those kids that have gone through the process then become the young leaders. So they, they become the major role players. And there are some incredible, incredible, very, very talented kids who, some of them have gone off to study at university, some of them are studying music. I mean, these are all things that ordinarily these kids would not have any access to. When we first arrived in Barrydale, there were no kids going into tertiary education from, from here. Now there are. There are kids studying medicine. There are kids studying law. There are kids studying accountancy, ballet, painting. Wow. Sort of, they are in graphic design and, and animation. I mean, and they, they are the future, you know? And, and that's... Peter Tequilo, really, hats off to him. He's done the most incredible, incredible work with, mm. with people and kids in this area specifically. They call him the Pied Piper of Barrydale. Really? He would play his guitar and 
he just kids just uh, gravitate towards him, and he's just such a gentle, gentle man. And he's been uh, he's been recognised for that, and they've as the First Nations have, or he is from the First Nations. He's from he's been recognised as the chief of the Atakwa Nation now, and that's mm. the first. Those are the group of people that were originally first here in this mm. area. He's popularised the real dance, which is the dance mm. the San would do after going out and hunting. They would talk about the day's activity in, in, in mm. dance. And there's a special sort of vibe that the kids do where they kick up all the dust. Mm. So it's, it's great to watch. Yeah. <laughs> you still, you just get into this <laughs> movement. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, but it's amazing work you're doing. I really admire you so much. But thank, thank you. you so much for your time. Thank you. And I'm coming thank to you. visit you in, in Bali. You must, please. Yeah. Please. No, I will. Okay. <laughs> okay, Scott, have a lovely day. Thank you, Pietro. Thank you. Bye. You Bye. too. Bye. Like a dog. Bye. Thank you, Yale. Bye.